So if you're trying to get started in making music on a computer, here's what you need to get started. You can get started with making music on a computer with a relatively cheap computer because nowadays CPU processing has gotten so strong so fast that we don't have the issues that we had back in like 2010 when the CPU was struggling to keep up with the necessary uh, cycles that's needed for an application. And now let me explain to you what a CPU does in regards to an audio application of DAW. A CPU is gonna help with coordinating all of your different waves, coordinating all the different sequences that come along with your actual core application. So when I say core application, I'm referring to the actual EXE, the executable that's actually running the um, the DAW. So that can be protools.exe or cubase.exe or whatever, the main primary exe. So we're going to dive a little deep, but you have to understand this in order for you to get the full scope. If you're curious as to what is running when you're um, running your application, all you have to do if you're on Windows is open up the task manager and it will tell you in the application description what are all the files associated with that particular process, that main process, our application name. So if you're running like ProSign and Studio Plus, it tells you. It'll also tell you what the CPU utilization is in addition to your, your memory utilization. We're going to get into memory in a second, but going back to CPU, your CPU is very important um, if you're using a lot of uh, computational power for that to do your, your algorithms when it comes to your different processing pl plugins and things like that. And also too, if you have a DAW that just is not set up to be multi-thread or multi-core. What does multi-core mean and why is it important in DAW and how does that actually relate to your CPU? Well, multi-core is important because you can have faster, smaller core or smaller number of core CPUs and get great processing power. So say, for example, you have, let me ask you this question. This is a good question. Um, let's just say that you have a four core, a quad core CPU that has a clock speed of 1.8 per core. That means it is a CPU chip that has four core logical cores inside of it. And inside of each core, the fastest it can go is 1.8 gigahertz, right? Versus having um, an eight core, right? An eight core CPU that say, for example, has 1.6 gigahertz, right? Which one do you think is faster for a single core application? Okay. If you pick the four core, you're right. And the reason why is because the clock speed is more important. The CPU clock speed is more important than the number of cores you have if it's of low, a lower speed, but the same architecture. Now, let's take it a step further. Now, this isn't necessarily the, um, as troublesome as it used to be, but we're going to go kind of deep into computer science here, okay, guys? Some processors have the ability to perform more operations per second than other processors. And so what we call that is CPU architecture, okay? That means that, for example, you may have heard of hyperthreading. Hyperthreading is a is a is a patent that Intel had for a long time that AMD was not allowed to copy. So essentially, what that allowed Intel to do, if your application was optimized with hyperthreading, it allowed it to do um, almost double the amount of calculations within the same amount of time that a, a competitor or non-Intel chip would do it. And so, what that meant was that. Intel's were just incredibly faster when they were optimized, just incredibly faster. And when you're talking about real-time effects, you're talking about a lot of a lot of processing power being needed all the time. And so when doing that, that is why Intel's usually outperformed the, the AMD chips until the Ryzen architecture came and that changed the game and leveled it out a little bit. At the same time, too, we had historically we used to have a lot of DAWs that were written to just be on one core. They could only be on one core. However, over time, we've 
gotten more and more advanced DAWs, and some of the more popular DAWs have allowed multi-core um, processing to happen. So therefore, it's splitting that workload. It's, it's, it's logically figuring out how to tie back the sound effects and some of the other um, transitioning pieces with the DAW together in order to give you a much faster and a snappier process sound on Windows. On Mac, we're going to get to that later. Um, it's a little different because Mac now runs, they have their own PCs, they have their own, I'm sorry, they have their own CPUs. But as far as the Intel of the AMD, that's most of us. Okay, so let's just focus on that. Even some of the older Macs run on Intel, and that's the reason why the Macs used to be always very snappy, was because they were highly optimized to run on the Intel chip. That's that's one of the best things about it. Okay, that bit that aside, let's go back to one of the more important parts here. Um, what's more important, the CPU speed or the number of CPU cores? It really depends on your application. So when you're going and you're looking for your DAW, that's the application I'm referring to. You need to see, does the DAW support multi-core CPUs? If it does, then go for the multiple cores. It's gonna, it's gonna take the load off. It's gonna be much faster than a slightly higher core, higher, a slightly higher clock rate on a different CPU that runs on a single core. If you're running programs like, say, Pro Tools, right? Pro Tools is a very uh, real-time based DAW, right? Even when you're bouncing files with Pro Tools, it doesn't bounce them faster than the song goes. It bounces them at real-time speed. It's real-time effects. That's how Pro Tools is just historically set up. That's just how it always has been, right? That's why people don't necessarily use it as an electronic production um, application because it's really best for, you know, live instrumentation and, and playing things back at what we will call 1x, 1x being at the normal song tempo, okay? Some of these other applications, like say Pro Tools, I'm sorry, some of these other applications, like say Cubase or Personas, they're able to, 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 to print, which is what we call when you finish the song and you're exporting it, it's called printing the song. They're able to print the song at, say, two or three times the speed of the song because it uses multiple CPU logic to um, emulate the real-time effects. So it's, it's using a lot of math to get it done faster. Pro Tools has kind of historically been set up to be um, using real-time hardware, which is why they don't necessarily do the whole printing as fast as you can thing. So that's just one thing to take note. For most people starting off, you're not really going to touch Pro Tools. It's not even a necessary thing anymore in studios. You can pretty much rock with whatever you want and just give the um, the engineer the stems, which are audio stems, which are, you know, basically like mix downs of different elements of the song, and they can mix that and go forward with it. We'll get to that one too later as far as what audio stems are. That's a different video. Now, um, getting back to the CPU, yes, get you a CPU that's um, a decent clock speed and a decent amount of cores don't necessarily have to go too crazy. You can rock with an i5, just like if you were playing games, right? If you guys play games, you know that some games, they run on single core, some games run on multi-core, right? And so you have to know that before you purchase your hardware. It's really important to get because maybe with an i5, you can get a higher clock speed and just have like four cores or eight cores now, um, like Intel i5. Or you can go with like an Intel i9, right, which has more cores, but because of the wattage, they got to lower the, the clock speed of each core. So individually, the cores don't run as fast as, say, some of the i5s, which you can get cheaper. And if you're not using all the cores, there's really no point in getting something that's going to run um, on, like, two cores when all you, you know, and, and then buying, like, an eight-core or 16-core CPU. It doesn't make any sense. So that's where your CPU ties into the things. It's your brain. It's your logic. It's going to do a lot of the uh, arithmetic um calculations on some of your effects and different things like that on your music and, and obviously synchronizing different things together. It's the brains. Just like in your head, it's the brains. Okay, so let's get that out the way. Now, the next important part um, is become cheaper. This next part I'm about to talk about, which is your memory. How computers work is they work like this. You have a storage drive, which we used to call a hard drive, but we call storage drives now because there's, there's more than just a hard drive. There's solid state drives, which are technically different. They're not disk spinning. They're actually like little pieces of, uh, you could think of them like a whole bunch of like um, thumb drives stuck together, right? That's essentially what they are, right? Flash memory or whatever. Um, that's 
your solid state drives, right? And then you also have different forms of solid state drives, but we won't go that far. We'll just say solid state state drives and you got your hard drives. Now, with your memory, that's got more to do with with um, storage space or memory space that is closely stuck to your, as close as possible outside of your CPU as it can be. Meaning that it's designed for anything that's actually running on your operating system to be pulled very quickly. See, historically, solid state drives or hard drives, they're not, they were never very fast. The whole goal of a hard drive historically has been to store a large amount of data. I mean, a very large amount of data. So speed uh, or, or extreme speed was not the goal of those drives, at least today with computers. Now, in the future, that may change where um, your storage space is like super fast, right? And so you can essentially just instantaneously call up applications. But as of today, we're not there right now, right? Right now, we still have the separation with super fast RAM. I mean, super fast RAM. And like you have your larger storage base, which would be your storage drives or your hard drives. All right. What happens is your application, your executable, your EXE, which we call, we'll call it on Windows or maybe your binary, what we call it on Mac, um, that has to get loaded into memory in order for your CPU to, pro to, to, to access that and have quick access to it and, and perform different um, calculations based upon the function calls that that application has. Function calls, applications, is computer science, but that's the way that everything works, okay? Just know this, if you haven't caught anything before or after, just know this. If I have a 500 gigabyte executable, which calls a bunch of stuff to create the executable at runtime, right? Um, that's not the right one. Just know this, check this out. So you may have seen that um, RAM can be from 16 gigabytes to 32 gigabytes to 64 gigabytes to 128 gigabytes and, and even more so, right? For the sake of a DAW, most people can get away with 16 gigabytes of RAM. It's legit. Most people can get away with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Your Windows operating system will probably run on about three, right? That's going to leave you about... Mm, you know, 12 gigabytes of RAM, if you're just running that one application, that one DAW, then you'll have plenty of space to do any kind of like major samples. So think of it like this too. Your your DAW itself, by just running itself, it may take up, let's say, a, a one gigabyte, right? One gigabyte out of the 12 that you have left over, right? So that means you got 11 left over, right? Okay. So now you're starting to pull some of these synthesizer programs. And the synthesizer programs, depending on if they're using samples or depending on if they're actually creating the sounds, that's going to pull on different parts of your computer. So if it's a sample-based uh, VST, virtual instrument, you're going to have um, a lot more utilization of your RAM. You're going to have a lot more of the storage space there where all the samples are being called for your different velocities, especially if you're using something like an orchestra or like a piano or any kind of like real instrument where it's trying to emulate that sound. There's layers upon layers of waves that are being loaded into the RAM. That's uncompressed sound, right? Loaded into the RAM in order for you to be able to um, play these instruments or recall these particular sounds from these virtual instruments. And on the flip side, if you're an EDM producer and you're basically using synthesizers, which use a lot of math to like modulate or emulate the sounds and things like that, it's not so much sample based, it's actually like trying to recreate that logic. Those types of setups, those types of producers, they're going to really, 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 really benefit from having a very fast CPU, something that can quickly process this. See, your audio interface, that thing, that box, the Focusrite Scarlet, the, the uh, Apollo uh, by Universal Audio, or whatever you want to call it, that doesn't process your VSTs. That doesn't process the actual instrument sound. That may process your audio in general right? Just in general. But the creation of the sound, it still has to come from your CPU running clock cycles to create that particular type of sound. That's how that works. And that's why your CPU is your ground. And that's why we start with that. Because if you have a strong CPU, you can kind of get away with um, some of the other limitations that maybe like 
um, motherboard or other things that we're going to get to are going to slow you down with. So that's why RAM is important. I would say 16 gigs if you're running like some basic stuff. Um, if you're doing major productions, 32. I don't think you really need to do more than 32 unless you're some type of super professional or you're loading up like crazy amounts of of samples and wave files and things like that as you're recording in your DAW. That's where things kind of get a little extra. And um, I think for the most part, I would recommend most people just to be safe, go with 32. If you're on a budget, you can skate with 16. I've got 16 on my main computer. I haven't even thought about adding 32 on it because I haven't really needed to. 16 is plenty. Trust me, I was doing this on four. I was doing this on eight. 16 is plenty. Okay, 16 is plenty unless you're like, I don't know, playing like 60 uh, <laughs> high quality piano and orchestral sounds or something like that, then you'll probably need like 64 or something like that because you're just pushing an insane amount of samples. But most people aren't. So let's just focus on what most people are doing. All right. So we talked about the CPU. We talked about the RAM. Now let's talk about the storage space. Storage space is an interesting topic because while you want this is, this is where you're going to put all your music files, all of the things you install, all of the things that you create. All that stuff gets stored in storage. See, in RAM, when you cut your computer off, RAM gets deleted. RAM is not designed to permanently store information. It's just designed to be really fast. And as soon as the power is cut to the RAM, to those RAM modules, it literally just like erases everything and it starts over when you start your computer over. And that's one of the benefits of RAM. That's one of the things you have to understand about RAM. And that's why everything can't just reside in RAM because RAM is not designed to store your files. When you finish doing what you're doing in RAM, you have to save it to storage. That is how that works. So there's technically two parts of storage on a computer. There's temporary storage, which is RAM, and then there's permanent storage, which is your, which is your hard drive or SSD, which we typically would just call storage. Okay, um, if you're loading a lot of samples, a lot of samples from VSTs like high, like orchestra sounds or piano sounds, you're gonna want a pretty fast storage device. You're you're gonna want to go an SSD route, right? I'm not gonna get into the protocols for the actual cables. We'll just talk about the technologies of the actual storage devices themselves. SSD is faster than traditional hard drives. The issue with SSD though is that. SSD is a lot more expensive per byte than a traditional hard drive. With a traditional hard drive, which has a little hard drive that spins around in it, you're going to be able to get much more storage space out of that for the dollar than you would with an SSD. But if the money is not a big deal and you can go either way, go SSD. If you want real long-term super storage, I recommend always having like a, a substantial amount of hard drive space somewhere you can you can plug it in via like a usb port or something like that and you can just back up your files just in case ssds like i mentioned before they're really similar to thumb drives so with that being said they can also be um tampered with or they can be a little bit uh temperamental meaning like you, they could they could break they could break um hard drives are much more physical even though it's, it's a disc spinning around putting little ones and zeros on it it's just it's harder to uh, lose that information versus like an SSD, which is really more like memory banks tied together on a circuit board and um, operating as a storage drive. That's what an SSD technically is. But that's why it's so fast. It's much faster than your typical um, hard drive, which would be like a 7200 RPM hard drive, which is which is technically the standard now. But I remember when it used to be 5400 was the standard and 7200, you were like, you know, on some super overclocking stuff. But nowadays we live in 2022 and that's the current situation. That's where we're rocking it. So um, you, you can get probably like a one terabyte and be fine. Two terabytes, you'll never have to worry about external storage storage if you um, wanted to keep everything on there for the most part. Um, if you wanted to have like an external drive, I recommend having like at least like a one or two USB type of external hard drive because um, you can just plug it up, copy everything over to the external hard drive and just keep it as a backup just in the event that you lose your application, lose your work files, your project files, and all the exports and stuff like that that you create. You definitely want to back up your exports and your work files because um, those are important things to have. Oh, okay. Now, 
We've talked about CPU. We've talked about RAM. We've talked about storage drives. Okay, what is next? Well, I would say um, those are the most important parts, right? And your personal preference starts to come into play here. Um, let's talk about vision because I feel like that doesn't get talked about a lot. If you've got bad vision and you and you have to wear glasses, if you can get by with like not wearing glasses, I recommend getting as big of a screen as you can. It's not going to hurt. Get the biggest screen you can because with, with digital audio workstations, we're working on music files, your eyes are going to get strained. Um, so for me, it's more comfortable not having something sitting on my nose, not having something sitting on my head. Even if it's even if my vision is not perfectly clear, I can get by with it. I can blow it up, make it bigger, right? The bigger my screen, the better. Right now, I'm working with a 55-inch OLED, and that's been great for me because that's helped me um, perform, um, not perform, but like actually like produce stuff much uh, longer than I normally would. And the resolution is, is fantastic. OLEDs are just great clarity when it comes to TVs because that's what really what they are as a TV. But they're, they're great clarity. And I love it for being able to create something and, and see it at a bigger size without having to like hurt my eyes. So that's really great for that. Um, if you're looking for, if you're, if you're asking the question about frame rate, don't worry about it. With digital audio workstations, that's not as important as it with gaming. So I, I would say with digital audio workstations, go with size over speed. Speed is not as important. Go with size. The bigger the monitor, the easier it is to see your work. Even at a distance, if somebody's looking over your shoulder, it's just easier to see that. Another key component, uh, very subjective here, is going to be your audio interface. You can have a simple audio interface with one XLR plugin. Some of them don't even have XLR plugins, right? And, and, and what the audio interface is, is this. It is essentially a unit that exists outside of your computer's motherboard where it can attach either via USB, via Thunderbolt port or whatever to your computer. And your audio is actually processed through the chips that are embedded into the actual audio interface box, if that makes sense. <laughs> so basically, this box uh, processes all of your audio signal, okay? When does that matter and why is it great? If you don't use external microphones, if you don't multi-track a bunch of different things live, you technically don't really need to worry about an audio interface. You can just use the computer's onboard um, audio chip, embed it into the actual computer, and be good with it. Most of those are fast enough now where well, they'll work. On Windows, there is a certain type of driver designed to be very low latency. That means very quick. Um, latency is how fast it takes to get from A to B and back, okay? To A to B and from back from, to, from B to A. Okay, that's latency, the round trip time. How long does it take between me saying go and where it actually comes back to me? That's latency. Um, there are certain drivers that are generic like ASIO for all, which are free, and you can download those for Windows, and it will actually allow you to run with your native um, audio processing chip, very quick audio, and you'll be able to get around, around away with like pretty low latency. Now, latency is important pretty much if you're using um, like a keyboard or something like that, right? Um, and there are external audio interfaces that have really low latency. For example, Focusrite is known for having some of the lowest latency in the industry when it comes to external audio interfaces. Because their audio interface, depending on what kind of computer you have, it can be an external port like a USB or a Thunderbolt, or you can also have an internal slot card that goes into your desktop. For example, it can go into your PCIe slot and it runs really fast, right? I've done that before, even with like chips that aren't supposed to be used for technically like professional audio, like the Sound Blaster chips in the past, I was getting like crazy like 10 milliseconds all the way down to two milliseconds of, um, of response time with those chips because the chips were just as powerful. They're right on the motherboard and bypassing your USB chipset and going right to the motherboard, it's going to be faster than any USB. But if you're on a laptop, which most people are nowadays, you don't really have that choice. Thunderbolt technically bypasses that, but there's not many manufacturers for Windows that um, 
allow you to do have much flexibility when it comes to that. I should do a review on my Thunderbolt for Windows that I have, the, uh, the Apollo Thunderbolt. Um, there's some interesting hiccups with it and, you know, whatever, but I would recommend going with, like, Focusrite. Their drivers for their audio interface are fantastic and they're very quick. Okay. Goodness gracious, I feel like we're going so deep into this right now, and it's like, ah, oh, it's so much. All right, um, your audio interface, though. So this thing right here, this microphone right here is running through an audio interface into the computer that's actually recording the sound. Um, the audio interface allows me to have traditional microphone cables, which are called XLRs, plugged into them. I can also plug in a traditional instrument cable, which is called a quarter inch or a uh, TS, right? A tip sleeve, right? Which is your typical thing that you would use for like a, a guitar and plug it in. Those are usually mono. Um, there are TRS, which is tip ring sleeves, which are a combination of the both of them, right? Or technically it's like um, just a different form of an XLR, but with the plug, right? With a quarter inch plug. Um, so yeah, that's the gist of it. That's what audio interfaces allow for. They also, a lot of them have like really good preamps in them. So they'll boost the, the signal in the microphone to make them sound very clean, make it sound very clear. And, and it can make a, a low microphone, a low gain microphone have a lot of gain, a lot of clarity to it. Also too, when you want to play back your sound, audio interfaces have really good, some of them do, have really good um, chipsets inside of them that give you just really clean audio back, really clean amplifiers back. And so that that's great. Um, if, you're, if you're not running like studio monitors, you can still use headphones with a lot of these things and it'll be fine. You can use headphones with your computer, you can be fine. If you're just using like a machine, right? The machine, like not a machine, but literally like... If you're just running machine, <laughs> right, then, you know, you could probably skate with your internal joint. I've seen people run like Ableton and just use their internal uh, processor on internal audio chip chipset on their Apple or on the Windows and be fine. As long as you have as you're running, you're good. Just don't use W. Uh, I think it's called Windows. The wherever the, the native Windows drivers don't use that because it's always like a little bit slower. As you know, it's much faster. Um, so yeah, that's what it is with audio interfaces. We can dive into that more, but at a high level, that's what it is. We talked about CPU. We talked about your RAM. That is the storage for all of your sessions, like live storage as you're working on your files. Um, we talked about storage, which is actually storing all of your files, all of your potential virtual instruments, all of the samples for those, all of the wave samples that you create when you're recording your music, all the exports and things like that. That's what your storage drive saves, backing up your work sessions, external storage devices. We talked about your monitor, being able to clearly see what you're working on in your DAW, and we talked about being able to hear it, which would be your audio chipset, whether it be your internal chipset on your motherboard or an external one that's like an audio interface that allows you to plug in different things like microphones or whatever into your um, DAW, your digital audio workstation. So I think in closing, the last thing I want to talk about is how do you determine which DAW you want to work with in the first place, right? That is the most important thing. So let's logically walk through this because I want to make sure you guys don't waste your time. And I want to make sure you have a plan. You have to have a goal in order to be successful. So here's the goal. You need to figure out the DAW that works for how your brain works. Because there are DAWs that are set up to be groove boxes, a.k.a. this thing right here. So this is great for all the people who grew up working on NPCs. They can get on this machine right here. No problem. They can knock this out. This is easy to them. It's native to them, right? To me, I didn't grow up on an NPC. I grew up on a keyboard. I was actually making my beats on a keyboard. So for me, I needed an application that allowed me to use a keyboard, right? And then press record on the different instruments that I'm loading into it. So I would call that more like a linear DAW. Um, traditionally, that would be like your Cubase, I would even argue that Personas is set up like that. Persona Studio One set up like that. Um, if I'm a live instrument person, I'm only focusing on live instruments. You can use a Cubase, no problem. You can also use a Pro Tools because Pro Tools um, 
you know, it transitions well. Most live instrumentation people use Pro Tools if they're not using virtual instruments like that because Pro Tools is, is pretty is pretty legit. It's pretty stable. It's pretty good. Is it better than Cubase? Is it better than Personas? No, I don't think so. I think Personas is rising up there. If you're making EDM music, right, and you want to figure out how do you make EDM music the quickest, right? Well, Ableton Live is a program that you absolutely have to know about if you want to get into making EDM music. If you're an Apple user, you got to learn how to use Logic. Okay, go ahead and buy Logic Pro, okay? If you're just trying to do like music soundtracks, Cubase, Persona Studio One, um, those are things that are going to give you like sheet music out of the MIDI instrumentations that you make. MIDI, not mini, but MIDI. MIDI is a very old standard of um, computer logic, which essentially takes different notes and um, trans translates it from your keyboard to a real note and a real velocity of the note. That's what MIDI is. I'm not going to get into MIDI too deep, but MIDI translates like that. Most MIDI devices nowadays work over USB. And so even if you're working on a Mac that only has like Thunderbolt 3 ports, you're going to need, if you're going to use a, a, a computer controller, even if you want to use a machine, you're going to probably need um, a USB, whether it be USB-C, which is a little oval one, or USB-A, which is the more rectangular one that you're traditionally seeing. Um, and there's different various speeds of those. But that being said, though, yeah, you need to like download and try the different DAWs. When I was coming up, we used to just, we didn't always have like um, the ability to download all the DAWs. I went through a program called Reason, which is more like based upon like um, strictly virtual instruments at that time, right? And Ableton was like kind of a new thing. So I had one Ableton Live from a music competition that I was in. And I, and I tried it and I was like, I don't, I didn't really like it. It just looked kind of weird to me. So I kind of went past it and I went to Cubase and I just, I stayed with the Cubase. I worked with Cubase for a while. And then for me, Cubase kind of stalled. It didn't really get better. I came across Persona Studio One, which I had heard about for years because they were trying to get it better. And it finally got really good. And so I tried it and I was like, oh, this is perfect. This brings a lot of different elements together because in all honesty, some music is easier to make when you um, are using certain types of DAWs. You can make hip-hop pretty easy with machine. Machine works pretty well with that, I think, right? Sample, cutting up samples, chopping it up, really easy interface for that. With Personas, it just gives me, it works for my brain. I don't have to struggle. You don't want the hardware and you don't want the software to get into, your, into the way of creativity. When you're in the flow of being creative, you need to be able to just focus on getting the idea down. That's it. And that's why I tell people sometimes, even if you're not at your computer station or at your, at your music studio, hum it. Hum the idea. Take your phone out and literally like hum it. Put it in here. Because if you put it in here, you can come back to it and you can try to dally with it later on and figure it out. There's so many different ways to be creative nowadays. It'd be insane not to try to capture your ideas in real time now. You don't have to worry about carrying around a voice recorder. You can just use your phone. You can record yourself in a video, or if you want to pull up the memo application, you can do that too. So I hope, I hope with all of that, is gain, you've gained some clarity on what you need to get started in music production. And I'm not trying to sit here and sell you anything. I'm, I'm just somebody who's got a shit ton of experience in dealing with music, creating, making computers, going between Windows app, Windows desktops for like, you know, creating music, Windows laptops for creating music, Apple laptops for creating music. Dude, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, pick one DAW that, that works with you. Download the demos. If you need to, you know, do do it another way if you want to. You know what I'm talking about. You can get your little bootlegs or whatever. Just figure out if this works for you. Look at the tutorials. If you're stuck, look at tutorials on YouTube. People will teach you how to use the DAW. It's free. It's out there. It's free to get you started, okay? And then the biggest thing is find the one that allows you to be creative, that gets out of your way. All this stuff, all this hardware, dude, just get it out your way. Focus on being creative. Focus on getting your idea down. Okay, that's it. Just focus on getting your idea down. Even if you think it's whack, work on creating something from beginning to the end. Okay, and don't stress out. Like, you'd be surprised what you think is crap 
may end up being on like you know tv for a whole year because somebody thinks it's awesome so yeah that happened to me <laughs> anyway i'm proud of the music man i'll talk with you guys later peace